outro cast. Matt, I'm going to start off with pleasantries before I give you a bunch of compliments and say, how are you doing? And thank you for taking the time. You got it. Thank you. Well, we were connected by the Access TV team because you're on Music Mayhem. That's one of 25 projects that you've got going on right now. Uh, how did you wind up on Music Mayhem? Did you know the Access TV folks from working on all those countdowns? Yeah, I mean, I, I love Access TV. I've, you know, had I've had numerous shows that I've hosted or co-hosted on the shows uh, for many years, you know, and uh when it was originally called HDNet, I had an interview show called uh, Sound Off with Matt Pindle. That was my first experience with the company. And now, uh, and a lot of those shows ran uh, in reruns uh, on Axis uh, for, for quite a few years. And it's, uh, I've had just a great relationship with the channel for so long. I think Axis TV is, there's nothing else like that, like Axis anywhere, really, because uh, I'm, a channel that's dedicated to music for music lovers and people that, uh, uh, you know, care about music and the mm -hmm. way to, their lives and pop culture is super important in my opinion. So I love the fact that I've been continuing to do things, you know, with access for so long. And, you know, uh, we had a show called power hour, which, uh, you know, is being kind of, um, you know, it'll probably be restarting sometime soon, but you know, that's mm -hmm. uh, going to be, you know, we'll have a start date for that. And, 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 and you know, not too not too long off from now, but um, you know, it's great because music mayhem. Uh, you know, I was on because it made sense. I've you know been on the top ten revealed every single season since uh, it yeah. started. Um, and, you know, and I certainly you know love top ten revealed. In fact, it's going to be uh, uh, coming back as well, which is really cool. So it, it's uh, I think the next it starts out. Um, uh, the new season premieres Tuesday, April 16th at 8 p.m. Eastern. And I love doing that with Katie Darrow. We have so much fun. Uh, and so, like I said, there, I have an incredible relationship with the channel. So, and it's been for years, you know, it's amazing. Yeah. I, I look back and I say, wow, I've been working with Axis for a long time. So it's, it's so exciting. Uh, Darren, you know, I think uh, one of the things that's great about music mayhem is I, yeah. I You've seen a lot of other channels try to do things that talk about some of the, you know, interesting experiences of, of, uh, you know, what, literally like, you know, this unsettling, excuse me, the unsettling scandals, you know, on all those shocking secrets that people find shocking and those infamous sure. minutes, you know, uh, things that have captivated generations of rock fans. Uh, people talk about these things. Um, you know, there's there's rumors that go around. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where it's like whisper to whisper. The story gets kind of mixed up or messed up. And I think the thing that's cool about Music Mayhem is it really dives in to the facts that are surrounding not just the rumors um, of uh, a lot of these scandals and things. But it's so cool because, you know, everybody obviously has some kind of history. And, you know, bands and artists have been together or around long enough there's a chance that something in their career, I mean, take me, right? I mean, I've been sober almost four years now, you know, in a month, I'll be four years sober. Um, yeah. You know, you go through things in life. So, but I think that this show really addresses that. And it's got some great people on it, like Lindsay Parker, who uh, has always been such a great journalist. And um, a lot of my friends uh, who I know uh, through radio, um, you know, uh, like Megan Holiday and, you know, who uh, from K rock and, you know, for me, it's exciting because there's just uh, it's it's a really cool, fast moving show. You know, it's a half hour. And, uh, you know, these debuting, of course, with the uh, first episode, you know, April 15th, the Brits behind bars. And it's it's really amazing because I love, uh, you know, that we were addressing all the things like like Ozzy pissing on the Alamo and yeah. you know Keith Richards, of course, his legendary drug possession. Uh, situation that happened in Canada and you know David Bowie of course one of my heroes and who became a very good friend of mine yeah your memoir has great stuff about Bowie in there <laughs> that I don't think that everybody kind of realizes that the people that you're featuring on a show like this Matt Pinfield has been with them and or around them at some point in time in most cases yeah I mean you know certainly I have uh stories with Keith Richards you know I did uh before their latest album, Hackney Diamonds, I did the last interview uh, with all the Rolling Stones. Of course, Bill Wyman was out of the band by then. But in 2005, I got to sit down with all four of the Stones. And then uh, one time I was, 
you know, at uh, Penny Lane Studios, and I was uh, there helping Keith get the Keurig uh, coffee machine working. <laughs> he was doing some stuff. So a great time uh, there with the Stones, Paul McCartney. I've uh, I've done the album release specials with Paul, who's obviously a huge hero of mine, and probably the guy that I was the most afraid to meet, even after I had interviewed so many legends when I finally met Paul McCartney in 1999. And he was so warm and embracing. And uh, I'll just never forget uh, you know, our first conversation. We were talking about, Paul and I were talking about him working you know, with Eric Stewart, who was in the Mindbenders in 10 CC, and Elvis Costello. And then I, I you know, I, I was compelled, Darren, to say to Paul, I said, you know, Paul, I've always loved you and loved your, your songwriting and such a big part of my life. And uh, I said, you know, those journalists that used to give you heat for uh, the days, the, the Wings years, I go, the hell with them. I go, nobody could write a song as beautiful as Here, There, and Everywhere and as rock and metal as Helter Skelter, so they got nothing on you. And he made him so happy to smile on Paul's face at yeah. first uh, that we met and talked. And then, uh, you know, of course, getting to do album specials with him and just talk to him about a bunch of things like you know just the craziness of you know nearly being killed and mugged uh when he was in nigeria when he was working on uh band on a run you know there were just a bunch of things we had conversations uh and i remember you know paul mccartney saying uh you know the greatest thing was i was at you know the first time i met him i was talking about my oldest daughter jessica and how when she was little you know the beatles were the starting point i'd play for her when she was a little girl in the car and then when my second daughter was born 13 years later um amaya uh i was it was the same thing so i said to paul we're sitting in the studio and i said to paul yeah you know it's just like um with my first daughter my youngest maya she's uh it's it all starts with the beatles i got her a giant rubber sole like <laughs> like uh 3d thing for her wall and um literally uh the engineer turns around and goes uh Hey, you ever do you ever get tired of hearing that? And Paul looks at him and goes, "No, I never get tired of hearing that." Which is like Paul just told him straight out. It was so, so cool. Rudely, rudely interrupt you here. I've heard that if you talk to Paul McCartney about the Ram album, that he's super psyched. That there's certain things that he won't give you the customary thirty minutes, thank you, goodbye. There's certain things that he's psyched to talk about. Did you ever talk about Ram with him? Yeah, I told him I I quit. Yeah, I did tell him quickly, it and it wasn't recorded for a, for a broadcast. But I did talk about Ram because I love Ram. Ram is one of my favorite albums. Um, with too yeah. many people all the way to the backseat of my car, it's uh, I I absolutely love that album. I think it's an underrated record. Songs like Eat at Home is like, you know, <laughs> my girlfriend bought these like vinyl. Uh, like placemats uh, that are made that are a shape of a record for our, our kitchen table, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, we have those. Yeah, yeah. and so uh, and then I posted it with uh, you know on social media with "Eat at Home" from that album, <laughs> which was like playing in the background. Smart, yeah. but I love that, and uh, you know, yeah, Paul was fantastic, you know, and I and I have a relationship with Ringo, so you know, if you told me when I was a little kid that I would know two of the Beatles, um, I would have. Um, I would have, I would have yeah, I said, yeah, sure, man. You know, always a pinch me moment. It's never really lost on me. You know, those experiences with, you know, sitting there with Pete Townsend whispering in my ear, talking about new records that are out while we're about to go live at South by Southwest. And I'm just, you know, one of those times where I was like, oh my God, if Pete Townsend is whispering in my ear and talking about the Kaiser Chiefs. I, I was just mind blowing to me, you know, and of course sitting with the Stones and they were Stones. You know, I always tell people the Stones were, so cool and so not jaded like you would expect a band like the rolling stones to you know like you know just be like hey i saw you know at, you at the capitol theater in 1978 that warm-up show for some girls no like whenever you brought anything up a b-side like i think i was because you gotta remember when i was doing the album special um for a bigger bang we were doing it live so it was being broadcast in the u.s japan new zealand canada and yeah, no pressure like yeah, that, and what know. was it was so wild because we were on at the studios for premiere, which is now iHeart, of course, on the top yeah. of the Radio City Music Hall, those famous studios, and yeah. they all piled in and sat in front of me, all the stones, and uh like two minutes before the interview was going live, it was like a, a little nerve-wracking at first, but then 
they were amazing. And we were playing the actual stuff live. So we weren't like tracking it and then inserting the music later for an album special. So that meant that I was sitting with the guys for two hours. So, you know, sitting there with the Rolling Stones and going, you know, man, hey, Mick, was that B-side, Child of the Moon, uh, B-side of Gem and Jack Flash? There's a thing on the end of it that says, RMK, what, what, what did that mean? He goes, you know, he said, I go, you know, I'm not sure, but he goes, and then all of a sudden he would be into that and then him and Keith would have a, co have a conversation and they talked about this guy, Pete Meaden, who was involved with the who, <laughs> they were the high numbers. And it started this whole conversation. And then afterwards, Keith yeah. Richards says, uh, Mick says to me, Matt, that was a great interview. And Keith goes, um, Matt, that was, that was brilliant. That was painless, <laughs> which was his way of saying that he liked it. And yeah. Like, and one of my greatest things, uh, moments uh, during the Paul McCartney uh, album special when we recorded for that album new, he literally said to me, and uh, I have it on the raw CD that on the end of the interview, he goes, listen, if it wasn't my wedding anniversary to Nancy, you and I would go to a pub and continue talking about rock and roll. So when you hear from, you know, these heroes of yours, um, oh it's unbelievable, you know, and, and, and same with David Bowie, the fact that, you know, Bowie had, uh, when we first had dinner, they, you know, we were at this big dinner uh, that Virgin was holding EMI for uh, for Bowie, and it was like at a place called the Valerie Ballroom. And he was he put me right across from him and Amon and all the heads of MTV, like and Viacom. And I'm like a little nervous. That was when I was still having drinks, so I'm you know so I Jack and Coke so I can loosen up just a little bit. But Bowie and I sure. hit it off so well that um literally he had said to me, "Hey Matt, I'm gonna be going out on the road with Nine Inch Nails, and I, no one knows yet." but I, I don't want to do any singles. I would love your suggestions for songs to do. So he asked me to help him with a set list. David Bowie, I mean, that's like a childhood dream. And that was one, one of uh, two really incredible, uh, you know, major events and things that happened with Bowie. I mean, there were many times after that that we connected, but that, and then working the, on the Heathen album after he'd done it, and I'd gone to his place, and we sat across from each other on couches, and he played the record for me like a third time. And uh, and then he ended up, this whole thing happened where, I, you know, these songs he wasn't going to put on Heathen. He played for me like Slow Burn. And everyone says hi. And there's Neil Young cover of I've Been Waiting For You. And I said, he goes, well, what do you think? I'm like, David, you got to put him on the album. And it was like, and his assistant Coco made him play him for me. Uh, because, and then he changed the tracks on the album Heathen. It's unbelievable. So these are like... All these experiences in your life are just, you know, I they're never lost on me that I've been so I had such a gift uh, given to me that my heroes because I love music so much. I wake up in the morning, music's the first thing I listen to. Um, totally, you know, it's uh, so you know, and and like so, everybody on this first episode, if you think about the first episode of Music Mayhem, right? Ozzy, I've done some great interviews with Ozzy and hung out with him and you know, uh, over the years and I just had a long-term friendship with Ozzy and Sharon and the family. And I loved them. And, um, you know, and I never, never met George Michael, but uh, he's in here of course, as well in that first episode. And, um, uh, you know, in the second episode too, you know, I'm glad there's an episode on, you know, on the death from above it's called. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that I, that I love in there, obviously, you know, yeah. I have a connection to the Leonard Skinner family because yeah. I've, the daughter was born in Jacksonville and, um, you know, I became friends with this, you know, all the Skinner guys and Gary Ross and Tim before, you know, I was there when they got inducted into the rock and roll hall of fame. And, you know, it was, we had a great time hanging out. I even got to meet and spend time with Ed King before he died, who, you know, wrote the riff to sweet home, Alabama. Yeah. Ed, and, Ed uh, with two D's that shows. I know who you're talking about. Yeah. He was the Ed's who can do the double D thing. Yeah. He was, uh, he was so cool. And, uh, he was in Strawberry Alarm Clock, too, in the 60s, did Incense and Peppermints. And, you know, but the people that are on here, Buddy Holly was a hero of mine as a little kid, you know, when the sure. when the first uh, Old East Revival happened in, like, 1971, 72 with American Graffiti and Old East Stations. There was, like, a real resurgence of, you know, 50s, early 60s, pre-Beatles stuff, the good stuff. There was there was some, like everything else, there was, there was some Teen Idol stuff that was crap. But, um, Just you know, but... But Buddy Holly was amazing, so influential uh, with, with Buddy Holly there being you no know, British invasion. And right. uh, Buddy Holly's covered in here, obviously. I love Jim Croce, too. He's one of the most 
underrated mm -hmm. artists. Um, he recently had a hit album again. Like all of a sudden, something happened, and his like greatest hits album ended up. Yeah, it's the top hey, of the hey, charts, yeah. and I was, I was blown away. I'm like, God, Wiley, because every musician I talk to. There is so many people love Jim Croce and it, and he never gets any respect. And I love him. I mean, I I his three albums that he did on AM Records in the 70s before he tragically passed away. I mean, three albums in 18 months. Um, you yeah. know, those songs, Operator, and you know, uh, I don't know, you know, Dreaming Again or so many box number 10. That guy, there's another guy who uh needs to be reevaluated and reassessed. But uh, Death Row Above is such a cool episode. Otis Redding, one of my favorite soul singers. He's in there, Stevie Ray Vaughan. Like, it's, the show, Music Mayhem, is so cool because it covers just really important people there. So um, I'm very well, excited. If, if I can throw you one more compliment right here, you know, you just talked about Beatles, Stones, Bowie, your personal interactions with them and all that. And you were so hard to pigeonhole because going through your book, I don't think most people know about the early connection you had with Stone Temple Pilots. Then I don't think people realize the killer song that's about you. And I don't know if everyone realizes that you signed Coheed and Cambria to Sony. And then uh, being a 120 minutes diehard, there was the Bloodhound Gang homage to you. So in other words, you are generationless, genreless, et cetera. And where that curiosity comes from me is, when did you kind of realize that MTV was not the be all end all for you? In other words, that you weren't going to stop working because you were no longer on MTV. And in fact, maybe be more successful after MTV. Well, you know, M MTV was such an amazing experience, but it wasn't something that I expected to be honest with you. I, um, you know, when I, my love of music started, you know, because of my age, you know, um, I'm uh, pirate was, radio. Uh, that that's amazing. Yeah. Like pirate radio station, my dad and I built in the basement, you know, we never had much money. My dad was a hardworking man. He was a teacher. He got to go to college, uh, because of a GI bill after fighting in the Korean war. Um, you know, um, neither my, my mother and father both raised very poor. Um, and he taught me the value of working extremely hard. So did she. Um, um, granted, she, I'm grateful she's still alive. She's 91 and she's still going, man. She sells a driver's license. She's never had a ticket or a, um, or, or been in an accident. And so we, my sister and I, my sister lives not far from my mom. Um, and so we were pacing cause we knew, oh, she's going to get depressed if she, if they tell her she can't drive anymore. She likes to drive to her doctor's appointments and she likes to drive, you know, to the supermarket and to my sister. She also goes to concerts by herself my 91 year old mother goes to the universities down by where she lives in florida and goes to jazz and classical concerts by wow. herself she's like <laughs> she's got that thing where i go to a show by myself i've done it many times or i'll go with friends but if i want to see some music or i want to see a you know a movie or something great i mean you know it's not going to stop me if i have to go by myself because uh so that blows my mind that she's still my mom is still Hey, she goes, I went to this jazz concert uh, yesterday, but unfortunately they didn't have any vocalists. And I really would have liked to have some singers there. That's, my mom's 91. It's She's amazing. a and just like her son. Yeah, so it's uh, it's a beautiful <laughs> thing. But no, you know, talking about MTV and everything, I mean, I never really expected to be on there. I mean, I was, you know, raised when there was very little music TV. That's why I love Access TV, because it's a channel devoted to, to you know, uh, most of its programming is is devoted to music, and I think that's really a beautiful thing. And I, um, so for me, uh, I was you know this kid who wanted to be in radio from the time I was a young kid. And like I said, we didn't have much money, but my dad figured out a way through this catalog to build this thing from a science fair. It was I forgot what it was called, but it was a catalog. He bought it, and and he built a AM transmitter in the basement, and mm. we used. A beat up turntables that we uh, got secondhand and bought a Radio Shack mixer, ran the antenna up, uh, the, the wires up the antenna, and you could broadcast. We broadcast a block, and it was me and all my friends from the neighborhood when we weren't out playing baseball or running around the woods or riding our bicycles or whatever we were doing. Um, that's what we would do for fun. And I gave everybody like fake DJ names. <laughs> it was really funny. Um, and I'm still friends with all those guys. But, um, you know, but it's it's really funny that I look back on that and, and it's a beautiful upbringing. But because I got into I really was dying to be in radio 
because from the time I was a young kid, I always wanted to turn people on to music. My first uh, thing I brought into show and tell in kindergarten was a record. You know what I mean? So I brought in a record and um, and I continued to do that. So it was kind of the path that I was luckily blessed to be on and been able to do all these years. I um, The MTV thing happened really uh, accidentally. I, of course, was, you know, in love with MTV and fascinated by it. In fact, I had to go see it at my friend's house because the cable channel in our part of East Brunswick, New Jersey, didn't have it yet. So my friends in surrounding towns like Highland Park in New Brunswick, New Jersey, oh, yeah. <laughs> had MTV. And so, um, but, uh, you know, I went through those years. Uh, I was DJing in nightclubs. I was, you know, DJing in like alternative rock nightclubs and and playing music. I was supporting myself. I had a daughter, very young, um, my daughter, my oldest daughter, Jessica. And um, and then I was doing that. And then I was working part time in the radio on weekends and driving through snowstorms whenever I could do a shift. Like if you really wanted to do it, you were the guy that, you know, that would work the holidays. You were you were the person that would, you know, show up uh, when people got sick. You would you know, it was that kind of thing. But my my heart was so in it. So I loved radio because I loved music. And um, so it just happened that I finally got the opportunity to be music director at this radio station, one of the great first 14 radio stations uh, that played alternative music commercially in America. It was in a house. It was legendary on the in the on the Jersey Shore, not far from Asbury Park. Yeah. Uh, in fact, recently there was a picture of Jack Antonoff, who's won the Grammy for producer of the year yeah. three or four times. And Taylor Swift in a picture, and he's wearing the T-shirt from my old radio station, from uh, FM 106.3 WHTG in Asbury Park, because he loved both those radio stations that was I was on. He was also loved WRXP in New York City when mm -hmm. I was on there, because I played his band Steel Train. Oh, and yeah. We gave them love. Uh, just like we gave the Lumineers when they were just called Wesley Jeremiah. They were Jersey guys who moved to Denver. They were my daughter's dorm mates. The oh. guys, the Lumineers, they were my daughter's dorm mates. They lived in the same dorms and were friends. She brought them to meet me. Said, Dad, my friends, before the, you know, the young lady joined the band, when they first uh, came out, it was great. She goes, Dad, you got to meet Wesley and Jeremiah, my friends. And their music's really great. And she goes to see them when 10 people would show up to see what was basically the Lumineers. Wow. So I it, didn't... <laughs> I, I didn't know that part of the history of the Lumineers. That, were they NYU kids? No, no, they went to uh, William Patterson in Wayne, New Jersey. Oh, wow. So they were, uh, and they were Jersey guys. But it was hard to get traction in New York City, so they moved to Denver. And the rest is history, of course. And they're, they're still just the, the greatest guys, and I'm really proud of them. And Nathaniel Rateliff, who I knew before he blew up, he was in Born in the Flood, and I would support him. Uh, you know, so it's wild. Uh, so I have friends in Denver. But it was like, you know... Um, but anyway, so the, getting back to the MTV thing, I will quickly, you know, I'll tell you, I had uh, finally got a chance to be music director at this radio station. A guy came in, they changed the management, and um, he was interviewing people that were on staff for the music director job, which yeah. meant you were the guy who was going to end up talking to all the record labels and bringing the music submitted, and, and you and the, you and the program di director were basically going to pick the music that was going to be played in, you know, on in different rotations, and so. The owner of the station said to him, wait a minute, before you pick somebody, there's one more guy you have to meet. And, uh, guy, you know, God rest her soul, Faye Gage, she's uh, no longer with us. But I was the last person he met. He said, you're the music, you're going to be the music director. And that changed uh, everything because then I was talking to the record labels. They saw that I was a person who loved music so much that I was looking for reasons to play new artists, not not to play them. So, right. um, and that was, they thought that was refreshing. So, uh, it really uh, was a great thing for me. And I won these these radio awards, the Gavin Award for Music Director of the Year, 91, 92. And, uh, and eventually I got the opportunity to fill in at MTV, 1993. I read a, in a magazine like Billboard or R&R, &R, some of the music trades. I go, um, I see that Dave Kendall's leaving the show. So I call up Kurt Stefik, who is programming the show. And I go, Kurt, what, what's going on? What, what happened to Dave Kendall? He said, well, you're no longer working here. I go, you guys need someone. And I said this totally naive. I, I mean, I mean, this like never thinking for a minute that they're going to like want a short, fat, <laughs> bald dude who doesn't look like a model <laughs> to be on television. 
the guy le least likely to. And so I just said to him, I go, you know, you guys really need somebody on 120 minutes that like the bands will respect that knows the music. And, uh, and he goes, you know, I don't know if you'll still be in the demo. You know, I was like, whatever it was, like, like 28 or whatever it was. And he goes, yeah. he goes, um, 28. And he goes, uh, but I'll call you back in a week. And then he called me back an hour later and said, hey, they actually want you to come in for an audition. And I went in with a ripped Morrissey t-shirt on. I didn't even realize there was a hole in it. I uh, I was not dressed for success, but I went in and I, uh, and I was nervous. I was nervous, never been in front of a camera before really um, and did breaks. But I mean, the confidence I had was in, the, in my knowledge of the music. And so eventually got the chance to fill in and do, I interviewed Depeche Mode. They, they had artists hosting at that period of time. And mm -hmm. I got the phone call, hey, Depeche Mode are coming in. They don't want to host. So you're going to do it. Here's your chance. And I was like, okay. So I went in there, did that show. I remember Martin Gore was, was jet lagged. So he was kind of looking over the side and I'm looking at him going, Martin, look at me. Dave Gahan was like engaged, but yeah. I'm looking at Martin going, please Martin, look at me. You're going to kill my, my gig here before it starts. So for years I would tease him when I would see him go, look, man, you almost killed my TV career. And he goes, oh man, I'm sorry, man. I'm like, no, I'm just joking around with you. But, um, and so I didn't much with Depeche Mode later years, but. You know, and then I went to work there. What's crazy is I got hired to be manager of music programming. So I was one of the 10 people picking the music videos for for the biggest pop culture thing in, in America. Let's face it, at that period of time. Oh, um, yeah. In, I'm in, not going to dispute that. There's so many yeah. bands that I, and again, the compliments and the rude interruption here. Without your show and your leadership of it, Rocket from the Crypt. How would I have discovered Rocket from the Crypt? How would yeah, I miss those guys? Sublime. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, you were you kind of figured out the 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 Venn diagram of commercial but alternative and offensive but not so offensive that you can't show it on MTV. Yeah, it was, was a it was a place for you know 120 minutes. Even when Dave Kendall was hosting it, and uh, you know, and it, it was just this great show where people would go to find stuff that was different. Uh, that wasn't shown uh, during the day in the mainstream. It might graduate to that at some point if the band got more yeah. successful. But you would, you know, like you gave, you said, Rockin' from the Crypt, Speedo, those guys, John Reese, uh, I loved from San Diego, uh, you know, the guys in Sublime, you know, like there were so many bands, no doubt did their first interview there. And uh, I mean, you name it, there were so many bands that we we had played there first. And I, I loved uh, being a part of that show. And quite honestly, when I got hired to be manager of music programming, I did not think I was going to be back on the show because here's what happened. Uh, after I did the first one with Depeche Mode, they called me and said, man, you were great. You know, we uh, we just want to let you know that. And and I said, oh, they really like me. And they called me up there. And I'm like, they called me up from New Jersey. Then there's got to be something going on. Why else would they ask me to come up? Otherwise, they'd just like say, see ya. And I'd never hear from them again. Right. But I went up and I met Andy Schoen, who was my... Uh, mentor and eventually hired me and you know we've had a long friendship we were hiking in griffith park sunday and we um wow. he called me up there and i went to his office and he was ahead of uh music and programming and he okay. said matt we love the job you did but we're going to put lewis largent who was uh, the music director that he had brought out from k-rock in new york lewis was a dear friend of mine and he said we're going to put lewis on he needs more of a we're going to give him more of a high profile but we'll use you as a backup and and of course that was disappointing at the time but it was also like, you know, I, I learned a really uh, valuable lesson. I was still running the radio station. By this time, I'd, I got become program director and music director. So And and I had an assistant music director because um, the owner of the station didn't want me to not still be doing the music, like make, make, sure, make sure that I was in control of all the music because the station had grown so much. Um, and it was um, it was unbelievable. So I would every month, there was no internet. I mean, I would just leave a message for Andy like once a month just so he wouldn't forget about me. So he'd see me on his phone log. And then one day, I'm, you know, I've, I've been friends with some of the other people in the music department. I'd seen them out at shows in New York. They listened to us if they lived in lower Manhattan or in Long Island where they could get the signal from the Jersey Shore. In Hop Hog, Long Island, where yeah, the candlelight is. Exactly. I, I so, you know, it was one of those things where... I'm out to dinner with them. We're just out like, and you know, we were, I was friends with a bunch of them and we're just hanging out. I wasn't expecting anything. I didn't have an agenda. 
And um, they basically said that there was a couple people leaving the department. It was actually something else. They were one of uh, Patty Galuzzi, who was one of my immediate boss, and Andy right over her. Uh, she was like, hey, you know, I've got to find a PD for this Providence, Rhode Island station. And I needed, I, you know, I, I'd taken the station as far as I could in Jersey. I needed to do something. And so I said, I might take that job. And she's like, you would leave HDG? I'm like, yeah, maybe, you know. So, But then she goes, hey, you know, we're looking for somebody. There's changes in the MTV music department. So I interviewed for that job. And the funniest story that's in the book is, you know, when I knew I was getting the call to find out whether I got the job after I interviewed for it. But the radio station only had three phone lines. You know, it was, uh, there was for sales, a sales office, a production room, a reception, an AM and FM station, and request. So imagine the phone is busy all day. And I know that Andy Schoen is going to be calling me. I get this word. So right. I'm freaking out. You know, I'm like, damn, he's, he's not going to be able to get through. He's going to, he's going to change his mind today. You know, like you're like projecting and you're a little yeah. bit of panic. And eventually he gets through on the phone. Three hours later from when he was supposed to call, he goes, hey, Matt, I've been trying to call you for three hours. I'm like, sorry, Andy, there's only three phone lines here at the radio station. He goes, I'll tell you what, come work for us and I'll make sure you have more than three phone lines. And that was the moment that changed my life and trajectory forever. And then I went to MTV. I never thought I'd be on the radio again or on television, any of that. Um, because I didn't, what was really important to me was I didn't want them to think I had a hidden agenda. And I was really grateful to be a part of mm -hmm. the team that was programming the music when alternative was taking hold and rock and, you know, gangster rap and everything that was going on at the time. It was an exciting time for music. Um, so I was so happy to be there and be a part of that team and, and uh, you know, and just and fighting for artists. And so they get more spins on there. So that was good. That was good enough for me. And I was ready to take a back seat and work behind the scenes. And just uh, months later, they said, hey, you were pretty good that time you were on. You know, we're going to because Lewis didn't want to do it anymore. And Lewis Larger was like, Matt should be doing this show. So he was like, he wanted me to do the show. So um, eventually they said, you know, look, we got Oasis coming in and, you know, um, they don't want to host. So you're going to do it. And you've got three weeks. We'll see how it goes. By this time, I had been around the studio, you know, like usually it was the artist hosting or maybe Henry Rollins would come in or, or Jerry Lee right. Lewis would be Henry Rollins guest. And I'd be, I was a guy who was showing the artists around the studio. I knew the TV studio at MTV so well that I was so comfortable there. Unlike the first time I went and when I went for my audition. So I knew I had the job. So I really didn't care that much. I, I, I was like, I, I was like this. I love what I do. If I, you know, if this turns into a regular thing, that'll be great. If not, I'm going to have a lot of fun for these next three weeks. And after the first time, which was my second show on 120 Minutes, they go, this show is yours. And that was it. And then they found out that they were getting ratings and research that I was through the roof because I guess people related to a guy who wasn't, look, didn't look a certain way. And I was definitely the guy, as I said earlier, least likely to. More like your neighbor who is a music lover, a friend. R relatable. That's the key term right there. Before yes. you go so pejorative and self-deprecating. Relatable. That's it. Yeah, no, so, you know, it was <laughs> funny, too, because, Darren, I remember walking down the hallway and the guy's pulling me over from Yo! MTV Raps and saying to me, hey, dude, the Spanish and Black community is really feeling you, man. I'm like, really? That's awesome. I, I go, you know, he said, because you, you're so genuine. So, uh, you know it turned into something I never expected. I never expected. And next thing you know, the, you know, the ratings and research were so high. They're putting them out all the time. And they want, they wanted me to help launch M2. And that's a whole nother story for, which became MTV2. Yes. And so what a, what a beautiful uh, trajectory and of experiences that I've had in my life. They're all like pinch me experiences, things that, you know, when I, when I do certain things, I'm like, I always say, if you told me that I was going to get to do this or meet this hero of mine when I was a kid, I would have never believed you. And I, I would have said, you're high. What are you talking about? So it was like that kind of thing. Of course, uh, I always dreamed of that. But um, so, you know, I'm grateful to still be doing what I do. And that's, you know, like doing shows like Music Mayhem and Top Ten Revealed and Power Hour that's on there. I love talking about and sharing music, music knowledge, and um, I've always liked to 
for me, it's a positive spin on most things because, you know, I, I love music so much. And as you know, you said that I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I like a lot of different genres of music and, and eras of music. I'm not stuck yes. in one thing. And, and that's okay because if you're an expert in one thing, that's fantastic. But um, you know oh, me, I'm a little bit different, you know, when it comes to that, because, you know, I could talk to you about Sinatra and, uh, and I could tell you the history of Fats Domino and, you know what I mean, a Buddy Holly. And then I could tell you about a lot of other things. And Otis, you know, and so you can, you can host an alternative 90s cruise, which I know that you're doing in a couple of weeks. Through my yeah, well, I'm doing, yeah, I'm co-hosting that one with, uh, <laughs> you know, the Power Hour, uh, you know, hosts, you know, Josh Bernstein and, and Katie Babs, uh, two of those summer 99 cruises and Eddie Trunk. And um, and we're doing that, which will be fun. And then, uh, you know, I'm doing another one with the downtown Julie Brown in uh, January and Lisa Loeb. Uh, so, I mean, I'm just, those are fun. And, you know, I'm going to be shooting stuff. You've been overly generous with your time. The next time yeah. I speak with you, I'm going to talk your ear off and pick your brain about the Jersey Shore. Oh, and yeah. Van Halen. But in the yeah. meantime, yeah. It's amazing and inspiring to see that you're still at a top level in your career, working nonstop, sober, a published author, and it, in some ways you can argue the best is yet to come from Matt Pinfield. So thank you for the decades of doing what you do and being who you are and not appealing to the general demographics. Yeah, I appreciate it. You know, I'm so grateful. Again, you know, um, I'm I'm very grateful, lucky to be alive. You know, I had a teen aneurysm. I got hit by a car. It yeah. wasn't my fault. And I wasn't drinking either. Crossing, you know, I wasn't was not drunk that night when I was crossing the street when a person ran a red light and hit me and nearly killed me. And then, you know, getting sober was a was a big thing for me. And, you know, you mentioned it, some of the beautiful moments in my life, you know, like um the killers writing that song, um, all these things that I've done that Brandon Flowers wrote from my story. Um, and I'll sing it out. And then of course, you know, last year on my birthday, Dave Grohl went on stage in front of 60,000 people played my hero for me and, and talked about our friendship and the, and the band's love for, for me. And I was absolutely, my daughter, my girlfriend was like in tears because it was such a beautiful gesture and, and, and thing for Dave to do. I don't know how you top that for a birthday, but that was unbelievable. I just got to say, you know, I have so much gratitude for, for all everything that I've been able to do. And, um, and I continue to do, I'm very, I'm very grateful. And I just, Plan on keeping on going. You know, I'm five days a week on 88.5, the SoCal Sound, the, the public radio station, which is uh, almost brings me, it brings me back to my alt days, a comm early commercial alt days, and even Perfect. college radio at Rutgers, and you know, which was great. So it's it's really a cool to play a lot of different things and do that. And I'm on KLOS still doing uh, New and Approved, which I love. You know, I've been doing that. It's a rock countdown. It's rock and hard rock, but there's also classic rock and that. So I do that every Sunday night, eight to ten, with interviews on the on the legendary KLOS. So I'm on these two great radio stations in Los Angeles. I have a syndicated show called Flashback. That's a classic rock history show on a 180 radio stations in the U.S. and Canada, and uh, that's on every week. I've been doing it for 12 years. Yeah, um, you know, I do this other countdown for a uh, live for live one. Called it's a weekly rock countdown of hard rock. Um, that I've been doing a uh, slacker radio, uh, you know, is acquired by live one. It's, it's plays in all the Teslas. Uh, so I, you know, I, I'm just, I keep on going and um, I got healthy and that was the most important thing in the world I could do for myself it was, uh, was get sober and then help other people that are struggling with alcoholism or addiction. And, um, and I found an incredible group of people in the music business, musicians, and just, people that are doing anything. Um, but uh, so as we get roll back around to it, I, like I said, it's been a beautiful and long relationship with access TV. I love access TV. And I, uh, I, I love this, this show music may, I mean, it's uh it's so cool. Cause it's right at my alley. Of course. I love the stories. I mean, that's my thing. You know, I, what I do on my radio shows is I tell stories. I tell stories, some personal and then a lot of history, um, which is, mm -hmm really cool because I think that um, that's the thing that is so important and needed in radio and in music television is, you know, the curation, the stories, uh, those things get lost with an algorithm. You know what I mean? There's something an algorithm can't replace and that's heart, the human aspect, you know, the, the beauty of uh, 
Ah, oh, listen to that lovely thing. Anyway, so, but yeah, so um, again, you know, thank you for having me. And, you know, thank you for reading my book. You know, I wrote this book in, uh, you know, it's funny because I have them here because we're going to give away some on a pledge drive. But here it is, my Alfred Hitchcock uh, side <laughs> view, uh, all these things that I've done named after the killer song that Brandon Flowers wrote about me, which was a beautiful song. Can you imagine, you know, getting a phone call that, you know, Brandon Flowers wrote a song about you? And this is, you know, when they were recording their first album because I was trying to sign them. And then getting to watch them perform that song with the London Choir in Hyde Park for 150,000 people yeah. at Live 8 was really my, my like, can you imagine the the way it made, made me feel? I was like, because that line, I got sold, but I'm not a soldier about me mentoring the soldiers um, was really absolutely mind-blowing. You know what I mean? And, uh, uh, you know, to, to do get to do something because... These soldiers were fans of MTV and fans of mine through that. And it could get to go there and, you know, and actually do a music program for a weekend with soldiers coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. And these guys would just love music. And some of them were wounded and, you know, just had, had to learn and figure out ways to play again. And others were not. And it was a beautiful, beautiful, like, experience. And also, like, just... You know, it, it it it's it set my heart in so many different directions. And then flying to Vegas to try and sign the killers and watching them play in their drummer's garage, Ronnie Venucci's garage. And they said to me this summer, they were like, Man, remember that when you were we you were sitting up against a washer and dryer and they're doing Mr. Brightside and smile like you mean it in their garage. Now, you know, of course they play arenas, stadiums, festivals, but um I saw the saw the greatness in that band, and uh, uh, certainly, even though I didn't get to sign them, I stayed I stayed friends with them, which I think was really important. And uh, and Brandon wrote that beautiful song. And then when I saw that line, I got soul, but I'm not a soldier. That was referring to, you know, the was inspired by that experience I had with mentoring the soldiers with a music program. It's amazing how music gives back, and music unites. It's the most beautiful thing in the world, you know. So. It's amazing how Matt Penfield gives back. End of story. <laughs> well, I'm just very grateful. You know, I'm grateful to be here. And for me, you know, it's uh, it's a very important thing. You know, when uh, when I went through getting sober during the pandemic, mm -hmm. and uh, and the uh, news editor at Rolling Stone told uh, one of my friends who was helping put everything together for help me uh, go through treatment. He. He said to me, uh, or he said to my friend, uh, he wrote him a letter and said, listen, he goes, when I was an intern at MTV, he goes, I asked at least 30 people if they could help me with my final thesis for college while I was there. And he goes, everyone turned him down. Everyone, he goes, except Matt Pinfield. And he said, I, I, and you know, like, that's just being good to people. I didn't remember it, of course, but uh, sp said I spent about, two hours with him or something, hour and a half in my office and helped, you know, so he could interview me and ask me questions about the music business and look where he is now. And that's the beauty of paying it forward and just being there. And it's, it's wild how that, you know, those things come back around uh, when I was uh, getting my life together. Uh, Rolling Stone were so there and Variety Magazine. And, you know, it's, uh, those are the things and the letters that you get from people uh, tell you how they you've affected their lives or turned them on to artists uh, is one of the most beautiful things in the world. My girlfriend always says, you know, because my girlfriend worked in production with like, you know, on, on videos with Lady Gaga and films, mm -hmm. and a million people. And she said, Matt, I've been with, I got to be honest with you, I've been with people that are a lot more famous than you, but I've never seen anybody get stopped more by people saying that uh, you've had a major effect on their musical taste in their lives. And I thought that was really... You know, it's never wasted on me, and I'm never. I mean, I appreciate it so much. I, you can, uh, because I'm. You know, again, I was the guy least likely to <laughs> when it came to TV, right? I yeah, always... 2024. Not only that, the Royal Crackers uh, story arc, and thank you, Matt. Yeah, Darren, thank you so much. Don't forget, Music Mayhem. It's. I'm so excited about this show, and there's 12 episodes, which is really cool, and of course. You know, this first one, as you know, is starting out Monday, April 15th. It's going to be on at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. 
Uh, it's a cool show. Um, it starts out with that first album, uh, uh, episode, Brits Behind Bars. And I mean, there's 12 of them and they're all really cool and they're great. And it has music fans. I think people are going to love them. So, Darren, love, I love catching up. And thank you for the David Lee Roth book. Oh. I'm going to tell you. You know, I'm such a, I'm, I am a total music nerd geek who loves to read music books. I love books about art, music and artists. It was so cool to get that David Lee Roth book from you. And I'm like, you know, I catch up with pleasure, my and, and I believe your name is in the print because I used the Lincoln Park quote from a thing you moderated from them. So, hey, you you were there. Matt Pinfield was there. That, that's the T-shirt that I want to eventually see. Matt Pinfield was there. Um, you know, and I'm, that will be the future Access TV show that we see. It'll be Matt Pinfield was there. And there you yeah, go. It, it's been a, an incredible thing. You know, like the you know, like the thing in my book when I was there at the rehearsals with Nirvana and they're rehearsing to do Smells Like Teen Spirit and Territorial Pissings. And it was only like a handful of people it, during the day while they're rehearsing for Saturday Night Live. There were just so many beautiful moments and memories. And when you're living them, you don't know that they're going to be historically important. You know what I mean? You're just living them because of your love for music and you just want to be there as part of the music. And Man, it's it's been an incredible journey, and I I'm just grateful that I can I stay on it and keep on going, one foot in front of the other, just doing my best, you know. So that's it, man. Thank you so much for taking the time today. I appreciate it, Darren, and we'll have to hang and have another great music conversation soon. You know, like I said, you see that London calling poster behind me. That's the yeah. only tattoo. Well, I have two. This is one of them, right? Oh. But I was at that show when when Paul Simon and at the end of 79, smashed his bass on stage at the New York Palladium that became the iconic picture on the cover of London Calling, which was, you know, one of my favorite albums of all time. You know, it's up there with Quadrophenia by The Who is uh, my my favorite double albums. There's there's quite a few, obviously, but those two are really stand out. Outro.